do you commit to memory? The different characters, different things that you create into the password. You go on this platform, you have this password, that password. What can people do actually? Well, you've touched on a very um, critical point in cybersecurity, and thank God we have the Cybersecurity Awareness Month, you know, this month, this whole month in, you know, sensitizing people. To be honest with you, there really isn't um, a foolproof way of, you know, doing that. You have to come up with a with some kind of methodology to remember. So for instance, if you want to create a password for a certain platform, let's say platform A, so maybe you include, so you probably say, oh, the first two letters of that platform, then the password, then, you know, um, characters that you use. The problem with the internet is actually what you have touched upon. There is no way by which you can gain access to any platform without having to remember a password. So you have to sort of, it's almost like, you know, what I do, to be honest with you, in order to counteract this thing, is just to use my local language, you know, my local tongue, because I know that it would never be in a dictionary. It would never be in any, you know, so I'll just use it in a local tongue, mix it with um, a few numbers here and there, and then, you know, have a special, you know, one or two special characters that start and end it. So it becomes a bit more difficult. So if you have a methodology for it, so you just, and then, you know, what we've also seen is that a lot of people, because of that problem, they tend to use the same password across board. Now, one thing you can do is there are applications like LastPass. Now, LastPass allows you to have different passwords to different applications, but you have one password that, um, that allows you to unlock that LastPass. So it's like a container the container for passwords. So when you have the app, it can be on your mobile phone. So say you have a password to platform A, platform B, you store them there, then you now have one major um, password to secure the last pass such that when you want to log in, it just tells you, to, it just prompts you to, you know, enter your last pass password and then it will automatically take your the password for the platform you want to log into so that's how you can get so there are all sorts of plat, um, apps like LastPass and you know all those kinds of apps that you can use to remember you know um, the password so all you have to remember is just that one singular password for the last pass password then that would take care of, of of the rest so that's some of the other strategies that people can use um, in order to remember a lot of passwords that they use okay let me quickly ask isn't it the same thing because if someone is able to break through your last pass password yeah. and sees the other password, doesn't it bring us back to the yeah. same thing? True, but the thing is that that person would now need to have access to because of your mobile phone. And then remember that on your mobile phone, you have your biometrics, you have you know other things. So you, what you have done is in cybersecurity, we're not. It is ho almost hundred percent impossible to prevent attackers. But what you can do is you can limit their scope. You know, you can limit their um, attack surface area. So by using that last pass, it's an app on your phone. You need to use your biometrics to unlock your phone. Then you now need to use biometrics again to unlock the app. And then a password to... So it means that for the person to actually... You, you there are different some, layers. There are different layers. So what you're trying to do is, is just make it a bit more difficult for the person. So by just using it on your mobile phone, it's something you are, which is, you know, second factor of authentication. Now, um, I work in, in a company where we, we've seen that as a problem. And one of the things we've also done is, is it possible to log into apps without using passwords? Like, like, you know, instead of having to use passwords. Now, because if you think about the entire internet scope, it is predicated, it is based on something you know. So that's why you have identity theft. Somebody can... And the, the, the bad thing about digital assets or digital, when you log in digitally is, if I have my phone and somebody steals it, at least I know that it has been stolen. It's moved. So I can actually protect myself. But if somebody steals your password, there is no way in the world you're going to know. The person could jolly well log into your email and be checking your email, while at the same time you're also logging into, into it. So we've de designed a system whereby you use your mobile phones together with some kind of um, card-based NFC technology to log into without having to remember a password. It's one of the problems we're actually you know, addressing you know, um, in, in, in our company. So we've seen it as a big problem. Uh, and we, we, we see that hackers thrive on. I was just behind, you know, just before we came on, I was just showing you a picture of um, a very senior, very, very senior person in government who was being interviewed on TV like this, you know, um, remotely. And he had his password pasted, you know, on the wall. And that is a magnet for hackers. I'm sure by now so many hackers will be, you know, if he has not lost his account, I really do not know, you know. So another thing also is two-factor. 
two-factor, three-factor, authentic multi-factor authentication with your biometrics, with something you have, and all that. So those are some of the things that people can do, you know, to safeguard these things as we go forward. I hear more of ethical working, and then I would like you to educate us on that. At what point do you engage in ethical working, and what could be the impact? Ethical hacking is an industry that was brought about as a result of all the issues, you know, confounding the internet. And what are, you know, companies, you know, at the, I remember back in 20, 2000, year, 2000, year, 2001, people, companies didn't want to move online because they were thinking, why would I move my, you know, servers online for people to connect? But unfortunately, if you don't move online, you don't get business. How is somebody, you know, outside the country going to see you? So it was an industry that, you know, that, was, that, that generally created itself and said, hang on, if we have hackers hacking into systems, breaking into computers, breaking into phones, why can't we leverage that skill? After all, they are doing it one way. So why can't we, you know, get these people or train our people to learn exactly how they are breaking in? Because it, it usually takes a thief to know how to secure. So if somebody has used a loophole to get into, it's like, a, it's like the way police, um, you know, foreign police people train. They actually train themselves in the art of, you know, crime. So that when you you can gauge, so it's a it's a way for organizations to train their people to say, look, let's explore the ways hackers work. If we understand the way hackers work, then if I hack into an organization, I can better tell them to say, look, this was the methodology or this was the way I got into your um, um, organization. And this is what you need to do to protect yourself. I mean, when I was younger, we, they used to parade some people um, on screen when they, they use some kind of hangar to unlock cars, you know? So the police will parade them and tell them to demonstrate how they you know, were able to unlock it. What were they doing? They're trying to show the public that, okay, these are the people that are doing this, and this is the method they're using to go through this. So when you understand the method, you now know how to better protect yourself. So that is the whole ethos of ethical hacking. It's actually hacking, but positive, hacking where you hack an organization and then you now write a report and to tell them that look this was what i did this was what i did this was what i did and to protect yourself this is what you need to do this is what you need to do this is what you need to do so that is that industry about ethical hacking and it is i think it's one of the um best in you know cyber security industries growing and anybody can actually get into it because you know it's 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 um it's a new field that you can get into all right. In, in hacking or getting access to people's uh, data, uh, one of the things that people are doing now, they're moving where they store their data. This brings us now to cloud computing. What is cloud computing? Good. Um, cloud computing is just a way for um, businesses and organizations to move their data from on-premise to remote sites. So instead of having to set up an infrastructure before now, if you, you, you have to set up your own infrastructure, you have to set up your own servers, you have to set up your own network, you have to set up, you know, just because you want to run a business, that's not your primary business. So imagine a studio like this now where you want to, you know, you want to set up your own email, you want to set up your own, you know, but now, cloud computing now says, you don't have to bother about that. All you need to do is just buy a, um, um, a location on the internet and then we will provide you with the servers, with the storage, with the network, with the infrastructure that you need. All you need to do is, and by the way, we all use cloud com computing every day, whether we like it or not. If you're on social media, you're using cloud computing. As we are here, if you're streaming on YouTube, that's cloud computing. Im imagine if you had to set up the infrastructure of YouTube that you're using to. Now, you don't, all you need to do is connect the cameras and you stream. Back in the day, you'd ha actually have to set up the servers. You have to set up the infrastructure. You'd have to set up the software that will power the streaming. You'd have to, have to set up the, the internet you know, servers. You have to set up um, even the analytics. You know? So right now, with cloud computing, all you need to do is just run your um, show and the cloud computing takes, takes over. That's what cloud computing is. Talk to us about the level of adoption in Nigeria. Uh, what has been the attitude towards cloud you know, computing and then how expensive it is to put together the infrastructure needed for this service? Okay, um, at the beginning, uh, people didn't understand what cloud computing and cloud infrastructure was. They thought, oh, it's about moving my entire data and everybody can see it and all that. No, 
cloud computing has come to solve a business problem. And what is that business problem? Now, at the, like I said, if you were going to do all this at the beginning, you'd be looking at, it, it's a difference between um, capital expenditure and operational expenditure. That's um, CapEx and OPEX. Before, you would have to invest the major chunk of your budget into infrastructure that has nothing you know you're not an infrastructure provider you are like a service provider so you want the service it's the difference between someone who decides to build a house from scratch and someone who just decides to say look a house has already been built i can just you know buy a, um, a, 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 a house or you know rent a, a place instead of having to build it's faster number two you said you talked about cost. It brings down the cost of running a business considerably, especially because you do not have to invest any capex. The way it works is you pay as you go. You know, it's like um, the way we use mobile phones. You pay for what you use. You pay for the um, infrastructure. You pay for the server. You pay for the the amount of bandwidth, the amount of you know data that you consume. So it has brought down the cost considerably and it's also enabling more businesses to start up you know that's why we have the proliferation of startups because it's very easy for me to think up an idea which i've just told you i'm just saying okay i want to do i want to create an e-commerce site for instance for my local maybe an e-commerce site for vulcanizers you know for somebody who's looking for vulcanizers or nannies i can easily go online it's very very cheap like you said it's if, if I was going to start that business with an on-premise infrastructure, I'm probably looking at 2,000, 3,000 US dollars. But now, with just about less than $100, you can consummate an idea and then you know, do rapid prototyping and you know whether that idea will work or not. And if it doesn't work, all you just lost is $100. Unlike if you're going to start afresh, you have to buy the servers, you have to buy the, you have to go and get you know, fast internet access and the software, the, then not to talk about the people that you have to build all this you know, infrastructure and pay them and you haven't started business. So that is the advantage of cloud computing. It enables businesses. And that's, the, you know, that's one of the things I see that if you look at the the 31 page blueprint by the minister of um, 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 communications and digital economy um, he came up with um, a five step blueprint number one talks about knowledge number two talks about infrastructure you know that's that you know um, no, number two is actually policy number three is um, infrastructure number four is um, um, entrepreneurship and capital and innovation and number five is trade so those are you can if you look at it you see that infrastructure is a big part of it and that infrastructure is that cloud computing that it enables you to do so there are companies that have set up that baseline all you have to do is just come have an idea build your um, software connect to it and you start your business if it works good for you if it then you can scale it allows you to actually scale you know as well you can move you know if you bought maybe 10 gig before and you see that you're having customers you know they're connecting to it you can you know improve on it so it actually helps you manage your startup capital you know very well we're in the days of uh, machine learning and ai so how does cloud computing enable the implementation of this a cloud computing without cloud computing i think i don't even think would have um the AI that we all are using now. Now, if you've used um, one of the, the major um, language models we're using right now is ChatGPT that everybody's using. But if you see ChatGPT, you see that it's on version 3.5 and 4. Guess what? There was version 1, there was version 2, and there was version 3. People didn't really use them because the infrastructure to train those language models didn't really exist at that time, or it didn't exist at scale. But with the new infrastructure, so it's easy for a company like OpenAI to say, we want to build one of the best language models in the world. You need infrastructure to do that. You need cloud computing. You can't train a lot. If you know how training the, an AI model it works, what they do is, for instance, now, if I want to train an AI model to recognize you know, anything, I have to go and take huge data sets of that thing. You know, so I want to train it to recognize human beings. So I have to take a billion pictures of human beings, put it in, you know, um, it, uh, as, uh, use it as a training data in an algorithm that will say, every time you see this, this is a human. So it's going to actually train the features. You are not going to train that on one computer. You're not going to train that on two computers. You need an, a whole set of infrastructure to do that. And this infrastructure 
they are very expensive. So cloud computing has enabled you know all those things for us. So we are able to better get um, a better AI models, and it's going to be like that you know for a while. So cloud computing ties directly into without it. I doubt we would have the kind of AI models. Not to talk of the kind of AIs that you know we see abroad, self-driving cars, for instance. You know where you sit in um, in a car without a driver. How is the car driving? So they've taken all the maps of all the different roads, the different intersections, the different you know roundabouts, and imputed them into an algorithm and train. And they keep retraining and retraining. And the car still has to communicate. You know through you know the internet to these cloud servers and then get feedback and then also report back it's playing a very major role in in in, in artificial intelligence and machine learning all right let's look at um, you know the services the career opportunities or opportunities for empowerment in errant in uh, cloud computing you know people like you are living on that then how profitable it is to take it as a venture or career it is look i tell people i tell um you know, even the policy makers, that when we make policies, we shouldn't make policies for ourselves. There's a tendency for us to think that, oh, we're opening up uh, infrastructure, hackers. Yes, there's cybersecurity, but obviously there are policies to take care of that. You won't say because planes crash, then you don't fly planes, you know. So the same thing, the opportunities are immense. In fact, I tell people that, look, if you have young ones, brothers, younger brothers, cousins, tell them. The, 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 the future is technology. It doesn't even matter what course you're reading. It could be law. It could be anything. It could, be, it could, it could, it could even be drama and art. You, people are infusing technology into these, um, into, these, into these professions. It is very profitable. It's new. And you see, every time, as part of, if you look at the fourth industrial revolution, what is the makeup? You have AI and machine learning. You have internet of things. You have blockchain. Um, 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 technology, you have coding, you have a lot of, and everything is software defined, everything is, you know, um, network based. So it, it's, it's very profitable, but you need the knowledge, you need the understanding. You're not just going to come in and say, oh, everybody's making money in technology then. Oh, it must. no, 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 you need to have, you know, a blueprint, and then you need to actually be, also be solving a problem. You need to be solving, especially a local problem that, um, that, that, that exists. Not just that you come in and you think, oh, I can get. That's why a lot of people get frustrated when you think, oh, this person is making money in IT. This person is making money in software. Why do you need knowledge? You need, you actually need, it's a field where you can't, you can't, there, there, there are no laggards. You just have to, you know, um, understand what you're doing and then provide solutions to people's problems. And it's the only field where if you actually provide the solution, People will pay good money to you, so it's very profitable. How you know when it comes to skill acquisition, you know how long will it take for you to acquire the necessary skills and for you to claim you're an expert when it comes to cloud computing? Um, the truth is, sometimes depending on the field, it may not take very long for you to actually acquire the fundamental skill, you know, the base knowledge. But it takes experience for you to become an expert. In that thing and you can only become an expert if you work on you know you must um, have solved problems. yes if you solve problems or so what I tell people to do is once you have the base knowledge say you do not have any tech experience you can actually learn these things on on YouTube or on Google you know so if you've taken a field and you, you you've seen that you want to say you want to you want to build something that you think is going to be of use go and learn you know so if it's software go and learn a programming language go and learn how that technology, we'll go and learn full stack development, go and learn, you know, back end, front end, you know, the, the, the operating system so that you understand how it works. That might take you three to six months, you know, of daily study. So you put in maybe four or five hours a day and then you practice, you do projects, you, you engage in these things. Then you find a place to do an internship. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, 10 years or 50 years. Find a place because when you now do the internship, it now exposes you to other aspects that you may know. You know, because in problem solving, you know, there are some things that you, it's just like going to school, there's some things that you see and they take for granted, as assumption in, in school. But when you get onto the field, you find out that some of those things you actually have to solve before. It's, it's like when, um, 
Henry Ford was going to create, you know, electric vehicles. It didn't exist. Roads didn't exist. People could not conceptualize. But he had the idea. So first of all, you have to build the roads because you want to what manufacture cars. So that's the same way with technology. You actually have to build that, you know, pavement. You have to build the road. Then you now have to learn the technology before you now bring your own solution to bear. So it takes a lot. But if you are dedicated, if you are you know, um, if you're steadfast in it, if you don't just give up, because technology, as easy as it looks, even building a website, it looks easy. I, I can put it together now. It's when you start to do it, you start having issues about even scaling. Okay, you can build a website where 10 people can log in, but how about 100 people start to log in and the server starts to crash? What do you do? How do you? So those are the things that, so when you get an intern, um, uh, you do an internship for maybe six months to a year, you learn the ropes, then, you can now start to look at how you can create something that other people would do. So all in all, if you say about a year, you know, about a year to a year and a half, you will actually become very good at that thing. And then as you walk towards it, you, you start to make the mistakes, you correct them, you learn more, you become phenomenal. All right, so how can businesses uh, have some form of integration with cloud computing and already existing systems and other kinds of technology? Okay, so what you can, what businesses are doing is critical um, services that they run, they host it on premise. So they host critical. So for instance, now this is a um, a TV studio. So you have staff. You have so there are some critical services that you do not want to put in the cloud. Maybe you have an uh, a, a an accounting software that you know you know you, you use locally to process you know um, funds and all that you can decide to say okay let's put that on our network so that people can access it or you have an hr application now but all other services that are not so critical or maybe that are critical but you can outsource because you know cloud computing comes with a lot of other things that you may not you know for instance we talked about cyber security at the end cloud computing gives you you know, cyber security, secure the server. So when there are new updates, when there are new patches, you don't bother yourself with running updates and patches and antivirus. They do it for you because you have actually paid for it. But imagine if you have to update patches. So if, if you're a studio and you're running 10 servers and you have to update antiviruses almost on a regular basis, that means you probably need a system administrator or a network administrator. That's more to your bottom line. But if you outsource this and that maybe 30, 40, 50 dollars a month, you get all that bundled it. They manage your data for you they manage the infrastructure they manage the security they manage everything so eventually most organizations are going to actually migrate to the cloud because it just makes a lot of better sense we are not even looking at the hardware cost for you to run your infrastructure local you have to buy the servers you have to buy the you have, you have to provide 24 hours internet access and we know how these things can be around here so that's the reason why it makes a lot of sense to actually get onto the cloud so that's how they're integrating you know for now they are just running you know um, some servers locally and some in the cloud but eventually we would get to everybody's going to get to the cloud you know there are two sides to a coin you know as much as this sounds good what are the hazards or challenges? You talked about maintaining, you know, having access to internet for 24 hours. So what are the challenges or the prices to pay when it comes to cloud computing? One of the problems is data residency. You know, um, the National Data Protection Regulation will say, look, if you're going to use cloud, the, the data protection and privacy, you have to make sure that it is secure you know where is that data sitting if you're using say all these foreign um cloud providers you know maybe google amazon it means that if somebody wants to access your data if i'm in nigeria i'll first go to america before i come to your to your server that no can we have the data you know local data reside locally so one of the things that they're pressuring some of these foreign people to do is to host some of these data within you know the country and then of course we have the um, um, local providers as well that well you can actually host you can actually put your data in 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 in, in those um, data centers as well so there are a lot of local data centers that are coming up that do cloud that you can actually host your 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 data you know your your you can recite your data in so some of those are some of the challenges and um you know especially around 
typically around regulation, you know. But if you look at it technically, um, it, it just makes a lot of sense to host the data. And then secondly, you are outsourcing that risk. So in the event of a breach, you would have signed an agreement with um, those providers, and then they will give you uptime. They will give you, um, you know, they have a business continuity, things like disaster recovery. So a lot of those things, it's a bit like, you know, you're outsourcing that risk. You're de-risking, you know, yourself from, because at the end of the day, they would now face, you know, the, or they, you know, the, the, the pay fine or whatever it is, you know, for, so it, yes, there are, you know, those disadvantages, but the, in my mind, the advantages far outweigh the, the especially when it comes to costs. That's the, that's, that's, that's the, you know, because no matter how you look at it, you have to balance, you know, everything. You have to balance the cost with, if, if, if I'm going to run my server and it's going to cost me $1,000, but I'm going to be paying 30 or $50 a month to this thing. Yes, I have this risk, but I, I'm balancing it and I'm sure that I'll get more value for, for this thing. So I think on the long run, um, everybody's going to embrace cloud computing. Do we have local providers? If we do, how much of patronage do they enjoy? Yes, we do have a lot of local providers and um, there are a lot of ac people actually using them because first of all, they're a lot cheaper and then they're a lot closer to, you know, to your customers. So remember I said that uh, if you're using any of these global providers, that's why even if you use some of these global providers, they try to connect you to servers that are closer to the country. And you see, because of the lack of, you know, adequate infrastructure we have here, even the low, global providers want to come, but sometimes they are held back because of some of these are infrastructural challenge, like you know electricity and all that, and providing 24 hours power. So we have global, we have local providers, you know, providing these services. We have um, Galaxy Backbone. We have you know all these. You know, that's government owned. Um, that's actually where all government infrastructure is held. The the the, the servers are. are are co-located so we have them and they're enjoying you know good patronage as well you know because obviously people and then the ease of you know payments you know like some of the global providers you have to be paying in foreign currency and all that but with the local providers you know we, we, we have them as well and then of course it also reduces you know on the internet you have what is called latency so it makes access faster it's easy for me to access a server that is closer to home than having to go to you know a remote country and then back into the into the country so there are a lot of them, you know, all over the place, you know, but they, only, they just need a bit more visibility, you know, and all that. So I, I, I reckon that, you know, we have, we have a lot of them, you know, providing the services. Let's look at some of the strategies you put in place to ensure that your cloud computing is not being compromised or being hacked or you, you maintain what we'll call your data privacy. Yes, um, a lot of them, that's actually what you sign up for like you know you have signed up for the security and because that's what they do that's their you know they have a subject matter you know expertise in that so they're used to it you know securing the servers securing the infrastructure securing the storage you know so when you host with them when you when you when you pay for their service you are buying the entire you know raft of it so they have things like um you know backup and you know, um, recovery. They have things like business continuity, disaster recovery, forensic investigation if there is a, in the event of in the event of a breach. So they have a lot of these things, you know, packaged in into the into your the service agreement that you're going to sign with them. And then obviously they have you know the ninety nine point nine nine percent uptime, you know, that they guarantee um, for your service. So they you know pretty much, which is why I said that at the beginning that ultimately. You know, because if you're running a business, a typical small business, a typical average business doesn't want to involve themselves in running, which is why we always have breaches anyway, because if you, even as an individual, you open your laptop every time it's prompting you to run an antivirus, you close it, you open it. At some point, you're just going to get tired, you know, because that's not your main job. You just want to do your work and get over with. That's the same thing. So at the end of the day, businesses are going to move to cloud because they've just taken care of all that. You don't have to bother yourself. You just fire and forget and it runs itself and it's a lot more secure. Hmm. So with this, what does it mean for some other businesses, like the hardware uh, manufacturers, those who set up the physical infrastructure, those who provide the antiviruses, what would it mean for their, their business in the long run? Well, they, they would have to move into software. They would have to move into other services because the hardware now is now, 
they, they will still have the business, but they are now supplying more of these, you know, um, data centers. So a lot of data centers are actually buying this hardware. In fact, there are some data centers where you can physically buy your hardware yourself as an organization and co-locate it on their, you know, platform, on the, on, you know, in their own data center. So you say, well, I have my server. I don't, want, I don't want to put it in my office, but I want to. So you, they're, they're still doing that. So you co-locate as opposed to using the entire infrastructure of, of the, so because cloud computing is made up of infrastructure as a service where you actually use their infrastructure. You have platform as a service where they provide you with a platform where, you know, um, could be a software platform, it could be any kind of platform where you run whatever, like for instance, YouTube is a typical platform for video streaming, you know. There are others for, if you want to, like Zoom for instance, now you may want to have a, a Zoom platform where if you're a, a heavy Zoom user, they can give you that. Then you now have software as a service, you know, where you give them your own infrastructure, but you say, well, I want to just use, you know, the software. So the, 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 there are more opportunities for those people to now move into either IAS, that's infrastructure as a service, software as a service or platform as a service all right let me draw your attention to this report by Microsoft that says over 1.1 billion IOT connections are expected in the Middle East and Africa by giving cyber criminals more opportunities to breach an organization's network IOTs um, the Holy Grail now IOTs are a bit new and people still really do not understand them it, it just means that Things are now getting connected to the internet. Things that would ordinarily not be connected to the internet, like say, for instance, um, your fridge or the street light or you know the the traffic, um, this thing on the street. Now, yes, it is. Every time you connect something to the internet, you're just opening up a lot more attack surface. There's a lot more for the hacker to aim at. So you see that there's there's something called um, SCADA in cybersecurity is supervisory control and data acquisition. These are devices that manage things like, you know, the water system, the electricity system, the traffic system. Imagine if somebody broke into, you know, that and stopped, you know, just broke into, imagine if somebody, um, you know, accesses the electricity system and then flips a switch and everything goes off and people are wondering what's going on. Those are the kinds of things that will start to have. You are now having, so you can break into one transformer and then you switch off the uh, electrical grid of a, a, a state and people are wondering what is going on. So that's, those are the challenges that we're going to have. But at the end of the day, um, we need to have policies Remember, I said the the minister of um, communications and digital economy came. He's he number two after knowledge is policy. We need to create adequate policies, and then our cyber crime laws need to be more. They need to treat it like real crime, like you know the way you treat physical crime. You know, we still yes now we have the um, electronic act where you know now they are take you you can now take electronic evidence and ad, ad, it's admissible in court now. Yeah. We now need to take a more um, proactive approach where people know that if you do these things, it's equivalent to you stealing, just num you know, and they, they will take, uh, uh, we just need probably one or two scapegoats, you know, where you put someone in jail for cybercrime and everybody will wake up to, wow, okay, this is becoming real here. So those are some of the things that we need so that we can, m we can better, you know, apply these technologies and move our nation forward. All right, let's move to 5G technology. Now, 5G technology is new. It used to be at one point was 2G, move to 3G, 4G, and then 5G. So uh, it, it's going to be faster internet, uh, which I suppose will take care of the internet downtime and ensure more stability. But what kinds of applications will need 5G more, and uh, what benefits will it bring to businesses generally? The first application that will benefit from 5G is video. Now, if you look at the internet traffic, almost 80 to 90% of internet traffic right now is video, whether it is on social media or, you know, on um, even corporate use. Most people now, especially since the advent of COVID, where people now decide to work from home, you can have your meetings over Zoom, over the internet, over, you know, uh, uh, all these platforms, the first benefit of it will be video. So that means that we can more like this kind of um, um, in interview could be done 
not just via Zoom, via like a real, you know, even things like AR and VR, like, you know, wearing the headset and you would actually have, you know, real time communication without, you know, those latency, those lag, and you can position me just as I'm sitting here, you know, those are some of the applications, uh, uh, video, then like, uh, like I said, again, AR, that's augmented reality and virtual reality will also become very big because you can then start to use them for education. I can be in my house and be schooling, you know, anywhere in the world. And now you look like I'm in class. I can see, you know, th what, what's being done. I can have more practical applications, you know, in, like that. So a lot of those applications will come in. And obviously, the traditional ones, data, you know, voice would also, you know, make a lot of sense with the, with the, with the traffic. And then even things like, um, remember during an uh, election, when you're trying to upload, you know, through beavers and the thing was failing, it was not connecting. That's because we do not have adequate internet infrastructure. So when you have that kind of adequate infrastructure, as soon as you are voting, you are uploading to the server, everybody is getting, uh, having access to it. Those are some of the benefits we're going to have you know, with 5G, but it's going to take a lot of time, it's going to take a lot of investment, it's going to take a lot of infrastructure to penetrate you know, those, um, those, those um, hitherto areas that are not currently being served. What are the differences between 5G, you know, and then the earliest form of uh, mobile network, 1, 2G? Is it all about speed? It's about, yes. It's, Ju it's just about speed. It's about speed. It's about, it's about speed and it's about reach. It's about throughput, you know. You will find out that with, um, with 5G, be it becomes almost instantaneous. Right now with um, 4G, you have latency. So... I mean, an easy way to look at it is if you go to a website when you're on 4G, 3G, when you click on it, you have to wait a bit for the, you know, for the home page to load, for the news to load, for the, you know, that is a function. It's not the function of the server or the bandwidth. Uh, it's a function of your own internet connection. But if you have 5G, you can, it's almost instantaneous. It's almost like, you know, the way, like, imagine if you're, if you're, like, if you're streaming this now, you know, on you need fast internet. So as you're streaming it, because streaming takes two things: you upload, and then the person watching is downloading. So you, if the speed is really fast, it's almost like you you don't have any kind of latency. So that's the speed. It's is very very fast. But at the end of the day, too, you also need devices and networks. So there are some five G um, um, providers. But if you are using a phone that cannot speak five G. It's going to downgrade you to 4G. So you actually need the, pl um, the infrastructure. Then you need the end devices to actually take advantage of the speed as well. So primarily, it is speed. No matter how you look at it, it is speed. You just touched on something. I would like you to educate us on that. If I need to upgrade my you know, mobile device, do I need a particular software to upgrade from, either from 3G to 5? And then what should be done to ensure that you're able to access 5G, even if that's not the way the mobile devices has been built? Yes, um, you, you don't need software. You need, the, you need the platform because when these manufacturers manufacture, they are manufactured to specification. So at the time they manufacture, so if you are using a three, four-year-old phone, there was no 5G. You know, so at that point, you'd be able. The maximum you'd be able to use will be 4G. And remember that they have specs as well. So most of it is um, from the OEM. So for you to take advantage of 5G, you need to buy the modern. You know, equipment. It's, it's like um, wireless computing, for instance. You know, there was a time when for you to connect to a network, you need to use cables and plug to a network. Your net, your computer didn't come with a wireless um, adapter. But as time went on and we started having this wireless access point, computers started having you know, wireless infrastructure built into them. It's the same thing with 5G. So, so you need a device that can speak you know, 5G. That's all you need. Yes. So needing a device that can speak 5G, does it also mean uh, that uh, it's going to cost more for data when you're using 5G or you're running on 5G? What will be the cost implication? Um, it's, it's going to cost a lot more and you're going to consume a lot more data. Um, right now, I know that if you want to get the, the 5G equipment here, you need to be looking at around you know, 50,000 to get the box itself. That's the, the CPE, that's the customer premises equipment. Then depending on the amount of data you want to consume every month, you'll be looking at typically another maybe 40 to 50,000 
in subscription every month, you know, and then, you know, so look at it as maybe over a year, maybe you're talking about, um, you know, 600K in, in, in subscription. So unless you have to be doing something, maybe you're a content provider, or maybe you are, you are someone who is a heavy internet user and it powers your business, then, you know, otherwise you may not be able to just, because when, when technology, when, when a new piece of technology comes in, it's usually expensive at the beginning. But over time, you know, just like with our SIM cards, when it came out, it was very expensive. But over time, as more people were coming in, fact, at some point, SIM cards were even free. So it would drastically reduce it because it's economies of scale, you know. As more people come in, you know, it, 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 it starts to bring down the price. So that's, that's what would happen eventually. But for now, it's still a bit, you know, pricey for a lot of average people. Now let's look at the issue of policy um, and then commercializing 5G tech. How far has Nigeria gone in these areas? Um, the, the infrastructure has been built at least by, you know, a few of the telcos. Um, but, you know, it's only when you've eaten breakfast, lunch and dinner that you would have to start thinking of 5G and all that. So the people that are still consuming it are more, you know, business type people, people that have their 9 to 5, you know. It hasn't really permeated. People are still, and then, like I said, you still have to upgrade your phone. You know, you still have to upgrade your devices. How many people even have, um, you know, they're still using some of their old devices. So it's still new. It's still penetrating, but it's a technology that has come to stay. And like I said, over time, maybe in the next one, two, three years, is going to, you know, improve a lot. The services will improve. The costs, you know, will reduce. And of co by that time, more devices too will have come in and will reduce the price, you know. So it's, the adoption is, is gradual, but it will get there, just like the adoption of the internet. So we see that it's, it, the infrastructure is there, the service is there, but it's just that we need more people, you know, to start to use it and therefore the cost to come down, which will happen eventually. All right. When the uh, NCC was doing accreditation or giving um, the the license for telecommunication operators to have 5G uh, to, or to run on 5G, just a few of them were able to meet that requirement at a time. And they did a supplementary uh, uh, licensing for some other ones. So looking at the way it is now, not every... Um, telecommunication operator in Nigeria would run on 5G. So look at looking at the competitiveness it will provide for both the operators and the businesses. How's it going to look like? You see, in, investing in infrastructure, in 5G infrastructure, is heavily capital intensive. So it, it's, it's not something that you, even if you have the license, the license just says that you can, you know, one thing is to pay for the license, one thing is to actually to roll out and then you don't need the skill, you need the equipment. Uh, some of them could not meet up because of largely that. It's, it's just really... And then you also have to look at your return on investment. How long is it? It's easy for the incumbents because they already have, you know, um, this user base. They already have customers. They already have people that are there. So they can easily project. But for a new entrant who is coming in, we first have to think of the amount of capital he's going to... Um, um, invest, how long the infrastructure is going to take to build out, the number of people that would work on, on the thing, and then before you now even start to talk about the business and the use case, and then you're now competing with people that are already there. It is huge, it's really, really, which is why the people that have actually ruled out are people that are already, the, the companies that are, the telcos that are incumbent. So that's, you know, it's, it's going to take a lot, but if an investor is patient, you know, we have the numbers, everybody says we, we have the numbers, but you know, you have to be patient. It's not a two-year, three-year journey. It's something like five, six, seven, ten-year journey for you to actually recoup, you know, your investment. So if somebody is investing for the long term, you know, it's, it's, it's um, an area to go into. Otherwise, you are better off becoming the normal wireless ISP, you know, and then you do your business. Okay. So would this open room for more foreign ISP to come in? If the ones that we have here are not majorly running on 5G? It will open up that channel for them, especially with ISPs that have capital and they're able to wait out the long term, you know, yeah, and they, they want to invest and they've seen that the market and ultimately um, 5G is going to get there, but it's just a matter of who is going to get there 
you know, with the 5G. So it will open up that channel. But even they may not find it easy because of the incumbents that are already, you know, the telco providers that are already in there. But it will open up the channel. They bring in their foreign capital, especially now with this, you know, um, Naira devaluation. It, makes, it, make, it means that if they bring in more of their, they can get a lot more. And it's going to also help them, you know, as well, because we have the numbers, we have the population. I remember that the, um, of, the, of our population, about 40% of us, you know, are still, you know, uh, below the age of you know, um, youth, between the ages of 18 to, to 45, you know. So, and as these people in five years' time, they're going to go, they're going to get, you know, they're going to start working, they're going to have, you know, the economic power would increase more. So, eventually, they'll be able to recoup their investments. Let me ask you, if you're in position to make recommendations to the government, what can be done to attract investors? You know, and then to ensure that 5G tech is affordable and commercialized. What are your recommendations or what will be your recommendations? Uh, first of all, I, I think the requirements sometimes are very, very strict. You know, it takes, sometimes if you look at some of the requirements for you to even attempt to, you know, obtain the license, almost, I, I, I can't even say there are a lot of companies that can do that locally. And secondly, even if you have the technical know-how, sourcing for the funds is also going to be hard to access to loans and capital from local, you know, um, financial institutions. I think they need to, you know, they need to bring the interest rate a bit down because if I'm going to do that kind of thing and I'm going to be getting interest rate from bank at close to 25%, and have not even invested and then we're talking about the rate of inflation being double digit as well we're talking about the devaluation of our currency it's almost impossible for anybody you know to actually attend so one of the things they should do is find a way to say maybe have a concession for local investors to be able to partake in this you know and maybe you know talk to the financial institutions to say look if these people come give them the single digit you know, um, interest rate, then give them tax incentives as well that, okay, we know that it's going to take you time to set up your infrastructure. It's going to take you time to build, you know, build out this system. We would give you maybe for the next 10 years, you roll out and we allow you, you know, make money. And then maybe on the, after the 10th year, you start to pay, you know, taxes. So those are some of the things that, you know, they can do. Just make the environment friendly, make it a lot more, you know, business friendly and easy for people to, because there are so many people with these ideas, but, you know, getting the idea to execution fees is usually the problem, just because of these government policies. All right. Earlier on, you talked about um, AR, VR, and that's augmented reality, virtual reality. How is this transforming businesses now? Wow. We are not feeling the effect here in this part of the world because these AR, augmented reality, and virtual reality are uh, expensive um, ventures, F chiefly because you need the equipment. So for VR, for instance, you need that headset. It, the, one of the cheapest headsets is about $600, you know. But if you have it, if you've used it before, you find out that it's transforming businesses a lot. For instance, you can do virtual training. You can actually be here. Not When I mean virtual training, not the kind of training you have on 2D surfaces like Zoom kind of training that you actually have and you're it's immersive like so you can actually if you're an engineer for instance and you want to learn how to um structure you have to learn how to repair engines you can wear the thing and they take you right into the engine it's virtual and you are seeing it and they will show you this is the um spark plug this is the cylinder this is and you actually can see and touch and rip and so it's helping in that even things like games um sports um health medicine people the the doctors that are actually um um carrying out operations through um vr and all that and of course ar as well is just you don't need equipment all you need to do is you can for instance um people use ar for say you want to you go to you, you you've gone to a boutique and you want to buy a top and you don't know how it will fit you can actually you know when you go in you you there's this vr glass i mean ar glass that you look at and you can actually ve you wear the top and you see the fitting without actually wearing it you know so you see the fitting you see the so a lot of fashion houses are using that you know to augment that so you don't actually physically have to, have to go to the store if you go to um, some online stores now if you if you you know you don't know how the thing will look on you they 
will give you it could be color the thing and you you feel it you see it and you see how it looks on you and it's easier to make purchasing decisions when you've seen how something will look on you so it's actually helping in some of those you know areas but over time and then you also need like we said you need fast internet access for you to be able to you know access some of those things so everything ties into one another we're talking about uh, virtual reality uh, you know vr and ar is becoming the rave of the moment talk to us what are the services that uh, this technology can be deployed into and then what could be the impact there are a lot of industries that you can use ar and vr for um one of it is okay uh, i'll give you a typical example of say you you're in lagos say you want to buy a property in abuja but you don't want to have, have to fly all the way to abuja you can have somebody real estate broker there you know walk you through the entire house you want to buy without you physically being there and i'm not talking about you seeing pictures or videos you actually have an immersive experience whereby you know they can create some kind of um, v, um, VR experience and walk you through so you it looks like you're actually walking in fact as it is I can even tell you that it looks like this studio as well uses some kind of VR because you see only that with this you probably need green screen and all that but in a VR experience I mean anybody you can make this studio become a space center you can you can turn it into whatever you want to turn it into and people watching would think we're actually you know broadcasting from space so that's the same thing with VR only that this time around you are actually a part of that it's like 3d surround sound when you're watching a movie and you're seeing you know you have those 3d glasses on and they start to hear the sound I see we are actually in the scene with the person itself so you are it's it's I, I call it the the um, uh the brain body binary dynamic because it's like you know she said you know when we all said that it, it mess is almost as if it does something to your brain mm. yes that's exactly the experience so they give you an experience like you're there one time i traveled and um i i wanted to i've always wanted to learn how to fly you know a fighter jet you know but obviously I'm a civilian. I'm not. No, nobody's going to put me in a fighter jet. Now, if they, I, and I went to this, you know, this um, fighter jet company. They have a virtual, an almost realistic experience whereby you sit on the fighter jet. You know, you wear the the um, VR head, headset, and they've done it in such a way that you. It's almost like you are. You feel when you know, like for instance, when you're flying a plane and you get shot at, or you shoot, you feel it. You, it's almost. I mean, it's sometimes it's unexplainable. Like she said, you can't really explain it to somebody who hasn't experienced it. So there's so you can use it for education. You know, there is a school taking students that have never left the country to to places that they, they probably will never be in their lives, but it looks like they're there. So you can see, you know, the Burj Al Arab, you know, as if you were there. As if, and all this is um, happening via VR. So. You put it on and you are immersed. You, you, it looks like you are in the scene with that person, which is why over time, like I said at the beginning, this kind of interview would probably be a... I mean, I watched one interview between Oprah and Obama and where they were actually far apart, but, you know, VR, just by, you know, it looks like they were actually sitting next to themselves. So, so it has a lot of implications in manufacturing, in sports and entertainment, in real estate, in, 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 in movie production. There is absolutely no field you cannot, you know, use AR and VR for, especially virtual reality. All right. This technology, whether AR or VR, thrives on providing experience to people, making it an almost real experience for people. But let's look at the availability of the expertise of the technology in our local environment. How much of it do we have available here? And the experts too almost none at the moment why because for you to be an expert in something you need the the right sort of equipment you know there aren't there are we don't have by now we don't have a vr what we have yes we have you know these headsets that people use primarily for gaming you know just you know the to play games and all that but it goes beyond you know game um playing the games it it, it speaks to us being able to create that immersive experience for people so we need like somebody to come up with like a just like we have uh, movie cinema theaters we need to have a VR experience center 
where people can just go in and people have created say i want to travel to bauchi or i want to go to gumbi and i've never been there and I, I should be able to go to a vr experience center put it on and i would actually walk through all the you know areas that i want to and it will look like i'm there i'll see i'll see the rock i'll see the rivers i'll see the you know that's the level so we need people to build the set the back end for these experiences nobody's going to come and build it for us do we have the skills um we can have the skills but right now we don't have the skills we don't have schools and for you to have the skills you need to have schools and training centers teaching people how to build these experiences for people to come and use and for you to have the schools you need people you need the equipment you need the servers you need the internet infrastructure that will power you know these things we don't have that yet it's not permitted yet but over time i i, I suppose it's going to get there but we just have to you know wait but for now we're still we're still more of consumers you know especially when it comes to using it for gaming and and, you know fighting battles on on games and all that and then there's also the issue of the metaverse you know i'm, I'm sure you, you about two years ago um, facebook changed the entire company name to metaverse which tells you that that's the future just a few days ago they came up with these ray-ban glasses with um with cameras that allows you to just be say for instance now um we all use google maps you know for but how about if i'm in a building and i don't know the direction you know automatically i can see it can walk me through the path you know without me on the, i'll just plug where i'm going and it will show me the path you know that i'll take go right go left and i'll be able to follow the path and so on. those are the kind of things that um you know they're already thinking about there then there's even the apple vision pro that was launched but these things are very expensive if you're talking about you know a millionaire just to buy how many people can afford it in this part of the world and but those are the equipment that you need to be able to take advantage of these things um uh, globally I would like you to talk to us about the differences between augmented reality and virtual re reality. At what point do you prefer one to the other or merge the two? Well, the thing is that they both serve different purposes. You, it's not like you can't, it's not either or. You know, they have different purposes. Now, virtual reality came first. Virtual reality is full virtual, like you are immersed virtually. So you can be in a place virtually. There's nothing physical about it. You know, you don't have any. So you are transported um, into that. Uh, it's like a movie where you're watching a movie and it's virtual. It's not real life. That's why it's called virtual reality. That's why you can use it for um, a lot of, you can bring things to life inside that virtual world you know things that would not normally so for instance now i want to learn how to use this camera you know i want to learn how to plug it i can take this camera take it into the virtual reality and be able to couple it you know without um tampering with the physical now augmented reality is a way for us it's it's a bit like this studio for instance now that we are in you know i know that i can see a green screen but the audience are seeing something other than a green screen so you have brought something that is virtual onto and superimposed it onto a physical um, uh, where people are and that's augmented reality so you are creating a reality of a physical place so um, that's why they always tell you that when you're on social media don't believe everything you see because I can have a, a room that is empty and decide to say I have an app on my phone now if I take a picture of this place Okay, I can superimpose something that is not on it onto that picture and it will look real, you know. So that's augmented reality. That's is that's why they call it augmented, like you are augmenting reality. So that affects the physical, unlike virtual reality that is completely virtual. This one is augmented reality, and like I said, a studio like this is a typical example of what augmented reality is. You are you, we what is real is different from what people you know are seeing. That's the difference. Then we now have a mixture of the two, which is called mixed reality, where you have augmented reality mixed with virtual. Real. So you can take, for instance, this studio as it is into a virtual world and have an immersive. So, for instance, now let's say you want to you want to interview, you know, um, the president, but he's not going to be available you can take the studio as it as we are now we take it into a virtual world and then you now put the president inside that virtual world and you interview him and it looks you know real and then you're immersed that's what is called mixed reality so there's augmented reality there's virtual reality and then there's mixed reality all of them together they're 
under the term called XR, extended reality, because you're just trying to extend. You know, it's, it's, it's just to create what is not out of thin air. That's what it is. Okay, with this, a lot of innovations will come up. Because while you were talking about uh, someone can actually virtually be in a place, I'm looking at tourism, how people don't necessarily have to travel from one point to the other. They can just, from where they are, they're traveling around the world virtually. But is there a downside to this? Are there um, negative effects that could come from this kinds of applications being used in businesses? Oh, yes. Um, there are, in some cases, there have been health concerns because you know sometimes you have to wear this thing and you have to leave them on you know for a while so some people can have some kind of you know health concerns and then there are things like exhaustion sometimes because when you're used to these things it becomes very difficult for you to adapt to the to the real world and some some people have even said it you know affects them you know mentally so it's supposed to be used with caution it's, it, it's a bit like every technology that comes in even when i was young when we used to play video games if you allow a child to play video games every time it's going to affect you know the you know his his psyche the same thing with the internet you can't put somebody on the internet you know 24 hours it's going to affect you know the person you know in a negative way the same thing with all these virtual reality you can't be on on and some you know there like the metaverse for instance you see the metaverse is um as good as it's it's good because some people are getting jobs in the metaverse like you, you have you have um you know broadcasters in the metaverse you have people who have um you know um restaurants and then you can work as a as a chef in, virtually but you have to be on every time there are downsides to it you know as well and then it, it's it's sometimes it could be time wasting you know it could be time wasting it could be you know um, you, you could have unproductive you know time so those are some of the downsides you know that we have with this technology and as as it's getting more infused it's just going to get worse we just need to manage you know how we approach this technology and make use of them from your experience how is it is to hire hands or skilled people you know that could be deployed in the management of this uh, technology in this it, it isn't very easy because we don't have the training institute, we don't have the schools churning out this, you know, even in traditional tech, the tech fields, it's difficult for you to get, you know, someone who is, you know, who is coming out of a university or out of a tertiary institution and you just take the person and plug the person and the person starts to be productive immediately. Um, but over time, as, as we use these technologies, as as we infuse them in our daily activities, you know, we'll have more people, we'll have more training institutes. So what we are saying is that some, I think the educational system, the computer science curriculum, the engineering curriculum needs to start infusing this, you know, technologies. But uh, except maybe the private unis, uh, universities, the, the, the public ones, the federal ones do not have you know, because th these equipment are very, very expensive, and which also speaks to the fact that even the private sector needs to also sort of come in as well. Part of the profits we are making, we need to start investing back into these, you know, institutes where our alma mater to say, look, this is the future of technology. We're talking about artificial intelligence. We're talking about machine learning. We're talking about AR, VR, blockchain, cybersecurity. We need to start to build labs, you know, where people can... There's nothing stopping a company in Nigeria from making a locally made VR headset that will be cheap, you know, for the local environment, you know. But it's only when you know the technical know-how that you can build things like that. There's nothing stopping someone from building a virtual reality software back-end that people can, you know, start to build on top like a platform, you know. But it's only when you have the know-how that you can do this. So some of these things that we need to do, we need to go back to the schools and, you know, um, start to engage the students from there so that as soon as they are graduating, they, they, they get into the field. Now, a while ago, you, you talked about uh, people working virtually now, remote work. And uh, in Nigeria, we have a lot of companies now asking their workers to do hybrid, some days on site and some days remotely. So if virtual reality is to be fully embraced, how would this improve remote work? Oh, absolutely. In fact, it is, it's going to probably even take out physical work because if I can be in a, if I can have a, if I can have a meeting like this without necessarily being there, all I need is the headset and a fast internet connection, maybe 5G that we've talked about, then it simply means that 
you would start think about how the internet enabled businesses anybody can have any idea right now regardless of you know your background and get onto the internet and pe the entire world can see the same thing is going to happen with vr so you can actually people can be in their homes and be studying abroad people can be and you can basically create a movie with with people living you know in this place so you don't have to physically get them think about things like entertainment say i'm an artist and i want to collaborate with a foreign artist who necessarily doesn't want to fly down here we can actually do a virtual um a kind of augmented reality where you place him side by side with me and it looks like we're in the same studio and we actually have that collaboration those are some of the things that you you can do you can have virtual meetings you can so it's going to help a lot in bringing you know people together it's going to help a lot in in um but the downside obviously is that maybe we are all going to become antisocial because if everything you are doing is virtual you want to go to parties virtual you can attend the party virtually you want to then what's going to happen to the physical human contact that human beings need you know that's why during covid we had some people went almost to you know mental because there wasn't that human humans exist to have you know contact so that will probably be another downside you know to some of these things but it's going to help a lot in businesses it's going to help a lot in in you know um especially as, as regards cost like you know you don't have to spend so much on transportation on once you have the equipment you can um you can basically be anywhere you want to be for an investor who is thinking how do i take advantage of you know the nigerian space to make money from ar and vr what are the opportunities? The opportunities are immense. First and foremost, invest in research. You know, invest in local research. Our own peculiar African problems, we don't have the problems they have over there. Invest in areas where, um, in Africa here, we do not have a lot of trust. You know, we don't trust ourselves. So you can look at it and say, well, say, and, and I also think it will help with foreign invest. So if somebody created a platform where normally if you're if you're living abroad and you are sending money home for somebody to maybe build a house for you or you know build buy a land and farm if you have something where you can give the person and the person can visit the farm every day to see the progress you know okay this is it encourages that and then it also stops the person who wants to defraud him from you know because he knows that okay this technology is not just um, cctv where the thing will not work you're actually talking about the person being physically there being able to touch you know virtually touch what you're doing and he knows that this is real you can so once you invest in research first of all invest in research then invest in the infrastructure of building these things out it may take a long time it's not a short term race it's not people that are reaping from um so if you look at amazon for instance when they started amazon was a loss making company for for close to you know 15 20, 15 or 18 years of the existence but they're ripping now because they invested in the 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 i watched a video where he said at the time when he was starting when he was looking for investors to put money people were even asking him what is the internet they didn't even know but he knew he saw the future at the time that people were not going to leave their houses to buy groceries they would sit in their house and they would go online and they would shop and people would deliver you know to them i remember a presentation i made to my professors when i was leaving university of lagos in year 2000 I gathered all of them together. I was so excited because I'd gone to do. Um, I did my. I'd gone to do my um, IT in a tech company. So I came back and I was like, "Do you know that this education that we all have to come to school and sit in the four walls of a class and for somebody to, do you know that in the next 10, 15 years people would actually sit in their homes and be receiving education anywhere all over the world?" At the time, it seemed far fetched. Like, mm, how is it going to be possible? How is a teacher going to teach on what bandwidth? At the time, we couldn't even have internet that could carry video. But look at it today. So the same thing with VR, HR. Trust me, in the next 20 years, maybe this interview, everybody is going to be wearing, you know, VR goggles, and we won't have to need, you won't have to go to places, you know, physically again.